Good evening, everyone. We continue on the discourse of Job in his explanation of how he views God and how he views the entire situation. Today, we are in Job chapter 27. He began his discourse in chapter 26. And it begins here. Job again, but we have a word here that is in front. And then this is a continuation of yesterday, chapter 26. It says, Job added uh, or continued to take up his discourse and said. Now, this word discourse may not be a good word to use. I think it would be better for us to look at its more literal form, which is a parable. Uh, that would also mean that these are all proverbial. He's saying in some poetic form, these are words of wisdom. So even in his discourse, he's actually speaking about God, and that is described as parable. And so he said this, and then said this. So he makes a kind of a swear as God lives. Now this, this is important, as God lives, uh, require us to understand that he is being very serious. This is as, as much as we can understand. He is swearing. As God lives is a traditional way of speaking. As long as God lives, this is what is going to happen. And so he, he asks these questions. Who has taken away my Right. In, in this case, it will be justice. He says, as God lives, he has removed justice from me. This will be he has, not who. Taken away my justice. And the Almighty, he has embittered my soul. So it's not a who, it's a he. And so he has made my soul bitter. So embittered is a good word. My soul would be my nefesh, my being. Whatever is inside of him, he is feeling very bitter. And so Job continues to maintain his innocence. We need to Bear in mind, again, I try to help us all uh, stay in focus, that Job is described by God as someone who is blameless, upright, uh, uh, fears God, and shuns evil. And basically, we are looking at Job's discourse. We are not told much about the other friends, uh, Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, but most importantly, the main character of this book is Job, Eof. And we must never forget that this discourse is coming from a man who is very serious with his life with regards to his knowledge of God. And so now in his discourse of God, he is also very serious. As God lives, he says here, he is maintaining that God has taken away my justice and the Almighty, and now this word Almighty may not be a, a right word to use, but we'll leave it for now. This is Shaddai. Now, Shaddai has been commonly translated as Almighty, um, but in a, a more, more purist form, let me just say this, in a more purist form, it would be Shaddai. Right, And Shaddai comes from two portions of a word. And the first word is hood. 
And the second word is enough. And it has been expressed this way, the El Shaddai is not merely God Almighty, which is commonly translated, but in the actual words, it literally means God who said enough. And it refers to the creation of the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, until the sixth day, and then came the seventh, and God said enough, and he rested. And so that, that would have been the understanding of Shaddai from a creator viewpoint. So the, the word English word almighty may not express that, it just merely express power. But Shaddai in the Hebrew expresses a relationship to the fact that God created the world in six days and on the seventh day he said enough and it stopped. And so he, Job, is complaining to this God as God lives and this would be El and Almighty here would be Shaddai. So we have El Shaddai in verse 2. And so I just want us to be aware that the ancients, at least in the, in the form of the patriarchs in the early book of Genesis, in the time of um, Abraham, right? we see God describing uh, himself as Shaddai. And uh, even in the book of Exodus, in the early parts of it, uh, Moses is told that God has not revealed himself to the people except as El Shaddai. And so Job would be in that category, the early parts of Revelation, and Job knows God as El Shaddai. And so Shaddai literally means he who said enough. Verse 3, For as long as life is in me and the breath of God is in my nostrils. Now this is his claim, right? This is his assertion, his claim. For as long as my life, and this word life, how should we say? Um, this word, as it's translated uh, life, it should read as breath, right? As breath. So let me just put this down as my breath. And this is Neshama. Is in me and the breath of God. This word here is also wrong. This is the wind. And this is Ruach. So we find this word here and here. And so this is with reference to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And God created man of four men from the dust of the Adama and breathed into his nostrils the Neshama of life. And this is merely saying that as long as he lives, as long as God lives, he is saying God is the one who has embittered his soul, his nefesh. And verse 3, as long as I am breathing, as long as the neshama is in me, that God has breathed into Adam, as long as the ruach of God is in my nostrils. Because in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, it reads that God breathed into the nostrils of Adam. And so this is with a relationship to the Creator. And hence, El Shaddai. And verse 4 says, My lips certainly will not speak unjustly, nor will my tongue mutter deceit or utter deceit. Now, what does this mean? It says, My lips shall not speak unjustly. Now, in verse 4, the word unjustly, um, I guess we could say un in injustice. This is good. Uh, you could also say that um, this is iniquity. 
So understand the character of Job. Job is saying, my lips will not sin against God, nor will my tongue utter deceit. Deceit is treachery. Deceit is falsehood. So you find this as an A and a B. Each statement actually speaks about the same thing, that Job would not say anything wrong. So what is he? He is now really maintaining his innocence. The entire discourse is to say, I know God. I know he is in control, but he's just left it uh, for all the natural events to happen, and that's what's happening to me. Uh, and he is saying, I, I didn't do anything wrong, and as long as I live, I will not admit to anything that I had not done. And he really admits to the fact that he is innocent. He has not done anything wrong. So this is important for us to understand that as we go through these few chapters, Job is not only maintaining his innocence, he is saying that he is a man of such character that he is not going to just admit a fault when he is not at fault. I think that would be a better way of understanding it. Verse 5. So it says here, Far be it from me that I should declare you right until I die. Now, the question is, where do we put, uh, put this? Now, in, in the Hebrew context, the line breaks here. Far be it from me that I should declare you right until I die. Meaning, it is the fact that Job will never say his friends are right. This is how adamant he is in maintaining his innocence. I will not give up my integrity. Uh, I will not renounce, right? My innocence. This this word here, integrity, uh, really means his innocence. And so we need to really understand and appreciate Job. After all, he is blameless, or, or he's described as blameless by God, upright, uh, God-fearing, shuns all evil. And at, even at this point in time when he's suffering in great pain, he's lost his family, lost his wealth, his friends accuse him that he must have done something wrong. He is still saying, even till the day I die, I will not say you are right. I will not give up or renounce my innocence. Verse 6, I have kept hold of my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not rebuke any of my days. Now, this word here in verse 6, the idea is rebuke or reproach. I think it's easier for us to think about it as, uh, how should we say, um, Embarrassed? My decisions does not embarrass me. It basically means he did not choose to do wrong. That's how innocent he is. He is claiming himself to be right. And he will not let it go. So this is his way of maintaining his innocence. Verse 7. My, may my enemy be as the wicked and my opponent as the criminal. Now, this way, this way I think we need to understand. Job is not 
cursing his enemies. He is wishing that his enemy be judged like the wicked. And he's leaving it to God. His opponents be as the criminal. So this is exactly an A and a B. Job is resigning to the fact that everything has its place and God will be the judge. And that's it. Leaving it to what he thinks and what he knows as how God will operate in this world. In verse 8, he says, What is the hope of the godless when he makes an end of life when God requires his life? I think we need to we need to check this out a little bit. Now, this, this idea of hope of the godless, uh, we can actually say he's godless, but he's more of the hypocrite in the Hebrew, right? The hypocrite. The hypocrite uh, or the, the impious. And this is not about being wicked here. It's about a person who rejects God, who, who doesn't have God in his life, in his community. What is going to happen uh, when God requires his life? Uh, what does that mean? It says, what is the hope of the hypocrite when he, when he gains a profit? Now, this word, Mix and end is not end of life. It's mix a profit. If the godless mix a profit, and then God requires his life. Now, this idea, God requires his life, literally means that God... Um, I guess you can say requires life, cast away his nefesh. And this idea here is God is judge. So if the person doesn't know God and doesn't want God and he makes all this money and then he dies, right? that, that would be a way of looking at it. Will God hear his cry when distress comes upon him? And so this idea here is very, very interesting because Job is saying he, Job himself is blameless. He is uh, upright. He is God-fearing. And then he shuns evil. And then we have this person who is godless com contrasted to Job. Is God going to listen to him? And this is a rhetorical question and the answer is no. Or will he take pleasure in Shaddai and will he call on God at all times? And so the answer here is no. If he himself is blameless, upright, God-fearing, shuns evil, and he is in this predicament, why should the godless be at the, at the behest of God? That, that would be the idea. And so in, in, in Job's mind, he says that, that wouldn't be fair. So this person who walks away from God will never hear from God until he becomes one who listens to God. So God will not hear his cry. This is what Job is saying. Now remember, Job is instructing as from his character, how he knows God. I will instruct you in the power of God. What is with the Almighty, I will not conceal. So in verse 11, I will teach you. I will teach you, and this word here is from the word 
Tora or Yara, right? Yara, of which we would get Torah. And this is about instructions. So I will Yara you, I will teach you about the power of God. And this is really not power of God. This is the hand of God. And this is describing how God works. Because it, it uses the word hand. And what is with Shaddai? Remember Shaddai? He who said, enough, I will not hide from you. And this is Job's explanation of God. Verse 12. It says, look, all of you have seen it. Why then do you talk of nothing? So let's explain this a little bit. All of you have seen it. And this would be literally uh, to perceive. It literally means to, to see something, to experience, right? You all have experienced it. So why, why do you, uh, this word talk of nothing, this word talk of nothing literally is, why are you, why is your breath, right? why is your breath in vain? Uh, I think we could say that. Why is your breath in vain? Why is your breath in vain? Now, in vain, the word vain uh, literally means, uh, I guess you could say, uh, empty. And who is this talking to? Why are all of you, this would be the three friends. Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And this is Job's retort to the three friends. All of you have seen what God has done. Why are you talking nonsense? I, I would think that would be an easier way of saying it. Nonsense. It, and and it, I think many of us may not see it this way, but as I try to explain to you the Hebrew, you find that it has a lot of contemporary equivalent. Uh, Job is like the person who, who maintains his innocence and his three friends have been so long-winded to accuse him and he is trying to tell them in, in not so many words. Uh, it, it's like, you've all been talking nonsense. It's of no use to me. You're not making sense. I think that would be a, a, a way of looking at it. Verse 13. This is a portion of a wicked person from God and the inheritance which tyrants receive from Shaddai. Right? This is Shaddai. So verse 13 basically says, this is the portion of what God is going to judge him to be. To give him the portion. What is due to him. And this is the legacy of tyrants, brutal people, brutal men, will receive from Almighty. Though his sons are many, they are destined for the sword. Now, who are his sons? Who is this his that we're talking about? We're talking about the wicked man. We're talking about the brutal man. Even if his sons are many, uh, it is for the sword. They are destined to be killed because they will be avenged. And his descendants will not be satisfied with bread, with food. Why? Because they will always be wanting more. So we're really talking about well, I guess in our modern day, uh, the 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 
how should we say the the sick the 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 dark side of of society uh the gangsters uh, the triads and he says his survivors will be buried because of the plague and their widows will not be able to weep the idea of not able is not there will not weep right because it is good riddance. Because there is no future with these wicked people. Though he piles up silver like dust and prepares garments as the clay. And, and I guess you can say that this is the wicked way the wicked man's way of living. He will have abundant silver is money. Like dust means a lot. He prepares his wardrobe. And then this would be as abundant as clay on the ground. There is so much that he has, but it is of no use. He may prepare it, but the righteous will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver. So he will not get to enjoy. Now remember, this is a proverb. It is not a narrative. So all of this is actually in an imagery poetic way. And, and Job is trying to say, you know, the wicked will always get what is coming. And the, God will bless the righteous. Verse 18, he has built his house like a spider's web or a hut which the watchman has made. Now this word spider's web is a bit tricky. This would be like a moth. That would be a better way to say it, right? And this would be a sukkah. This would be a leafy hut, which the watchman has made to look after the field. And so he has built his house like the moth, and like a booth of a watchman, he lies down rich, but he says here, uh, he lies down rich. Now, this verse 19, uh, literally tells him that he may lie down a, 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 as a rich man, and then when he opens his eyes, it no longer exists. Now, what does that mean? It means that all this is temporal and then in a short time, it is gone. Why is it gone? Because he is dead. That is what uh, is being described here. Verse 20, terrors. This would be how would we say this? This word terror is calamity, okay? Calamity. Things, dreadful things, okay? I think that would be better. Dreadful things will overtake him like a flood. And then it says here, a storm steals him away in the night. Now, this whole idea is that is an A and a B. Overtake, steals him away. All of this basically tells him that this wicked man will suddenly have all these events overtake him. 
because he is to be punished by God. Verse 21, the east wind carries him away and he is gone. Now, east wind is the wind blowing from the east. Now, let me just explain to you, if this was the land of Israel, we have Galilee and then Jordan going down, we have the Dead Sea. So what is the east wind? You need to know that this is the sea, this is the west, this is the east. And this is where the desert is in the land of Jordan. And so when it blows over from this side, this is called the east wind. And this wind is dry, hot and destructive. That is a picture of the east wind. And so when it blows, he is gone, for it sweeps him away from his place. For it will hurl him without mercy, and he will try to flee from its power. Verse 22. Uh, the word power here, again, from his hand. The hand of the east wind, right? So the east wind. And verse 23, people will clap their hands at him and will whistle at him from their places. Now in the old days, the ancient days apparently, uh, when they look at destruction, they have an idea of, well, I guess, clapping and whistling are actions that depicts the awe of destruction, of calamity. So that would be a way of looking at this. And, and so Job is saying, you know what? All the bad things that's happening, it's because the person is brutal. He, he, he robs, he's like a triad. Uh, he is wicked. And all these things will come after him because God has in his plan that he will judge all these people. And, and Job is trying to rationalize. Now, Job is not a wicked person. Job is not a triad. Job is not a brutal person. And yet, in his entire life, his life at that, this point in time seems to be unjust. And so, Job is now describing the fact that what is justice is when all these wicked people, they will be overtaken. They will have nothing after this. They will still die. They will be punished. They will be judged. And he is leading up to himself. But I'm not like that. But yet I am facing such a predicament. And so with this, we come to the end of chapter 27, the continuation of Job's discourse to defend his innocence and he maintains that he will not give in to any of his friend's suggestion that he had sinned because he did not. And so now he gives his own view of God, that God really will punish the wicked, but he is not the wicked. So what then? And so with this, we come to the end of our session today.